Well, greetings. This is a message that I've been wanting to do for quite some time. And it's regarding the mark of the beast. And, you know, there's much speculation today about this mark in the church and much discussion and <clears throat> goes on and on the controversy and as far as exactly what it means. And there's been a host of um, interpretations of what that might entail. I want to take a little different view of it today from the scriptures and maybe look at it in a more, in a less pragmatic way, we'll put it that way, in a more uh, of a symbolic, more of a, uh, maybe a spiritual aspect of it that perhaps you've never seen. And maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But uh, what we want to do is, is try to figure out by the scriptures what this mark actually may entail and, and what does it represent and and how does it affect us in this day and age so <clears throat> with these important factors let's look at the fact that there are two marks in the bible and very specifically laid out in the scriptures that there is a mark of god and there's a mark of a beast and so i think it's only fair that we delve into the Word of God and, and, and open up our minds and hearts to the idea that uh, what this mark means on both sides of the, of the track, so to speak. So uh, we're going to start by looking at the mark of God. And this is an important aspect of this, probably, probably the most important aspect of this study is to, uh, is to show that there are two marks and to show that that mark is in fact representative of something. So I'm going to go over to Exodus chapter 13. <clears throat> We're going to look at a couple verses in that. Now, I'm going to read about three verses, or two verses in, in Exodus, and then we're going to go to Deuteronomy. But this is verse 9. This is chapter 13, verse 9 of Exodus, if you want to follow along. And that, in fact, I'll start with verse 8. Thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is this done because of what that which the Lord did unto me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy right hand and for a memorial between thine eyes. And that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. Now, this particular mark here is referring to uh, the word of God or the laws of God and, and to, to keep in memory of something, to keep in uh, ever before them that God had brought them out of Egypt and brought them into a, a, a new and a living way and was going to bring them into a new land called Canaan. So these, these particular marks here are symbolic in the sense that God wants his people marked in the fact that they are separated from all else on the earth. And, and because of that, you know, being a separate people, they can therefore be his separate representation. And so these particular uh, verses here are referring to you know, between the eyes. Now, we have to remember something here. Now, the Jews took this as literal, and they would actually put a band around their head with, with you know, little boxes in there, and some of them probably still do it. I believe they do. Little boxes in there with scriptures in them, and they would t tie them around their hand, their right hand, and, and, and I believe they still do that. And they have little scrolls in there of scripture verses. And But what was intended here, really, by... I mean, did, did God really want them to physically wear... Um, the word of God outwardly? Or was he after something a little more innate? Was he after something a little more uh, inward? And I think the point here that, that the Holy Spirit was trying to make to the people of God, look, don't forget about me. Don't, 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 don't forget that I brought you with a heavy hand out of oppression and, and brought you unto myself a people that are separate in the earth to represent me. And I, I think here the mark of this particular this particular event is just along those lines. Look, 
keep it right here and keep it right here because this this represents you know the this is what's out in front of you the forehead what out in front of you this is this is the first thing that goes before you so keep the word of god as a lamp under your feet keep keep the keep it in your thoughts always that that you serve a living god and that he is the one that gives you everything uh, to prosper and also your hand remember whatever you put your hand to work remember that god has given you the power to do it god has given you the volition god has blessed you with the ability to use these hands for the, for the betterment of yourself and the betterment of mankind. And so I believe right here what he was what he was trying to emphasize is the fact that we are to keep it ever before us the word of God and and the fact that he is in fact in control of all things. Now he goes on here and this is in the 6th and we'll jump up to the 16th first. I'm going to try to go through these because we we got a lot to cover. And it shall come, and it shall be for a token upon thine head, and for frontlets between thine eyes, and for thy strength of the hand, and for by for by strength of the hand, the Lord hath brought us forth out of Egypt. So these are all symbolic. These are all saying, look, by the strength of God's hand, you know, He's He's carried them out, and and keep this ever before you, keep this ever in front of you that God has been your deliverer and God has been the one to, to spring you forth out of bondage. So here we see this mark developing. This mark is actually just, it's just a testimony of God upon those who have been delivered. So this type here, is, is, it's, heading, it's heading toward the church now. It's heading, it's heading toward the church age, that this mark and this, this hand of God or this anointing that is upon all of humanity who serve God, who give themselves to God. This is representative of the mark of God on you, the hand of God upon you, the influence of God upon you. And so if we jump over to Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to see the same, along the same lines. And this is what he says, Hear, O Israel, this is verse 4 of Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, thy soul, thy mind, and thy strength, and thy might. So, so what is this? What is this commandment? Really, what the Lord is saying here is this is really what it's all about, children. Really, the whole, the whole of the law is that you fall in love with a revealed God. The whole of the law is that He reveal Himself to you as one God. He's not a plurality of gods. He's not a pagan god. He's not a god for the sun and a god for the moon and a god for the wind and a god for the sea. He is one god who has within him the capacity to rule all these things at once. And so this is what he's trying to say. Love that one because he's the only one. He doesn't split himself up into sections. And so to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And these words, verse 6, and these words which I command thee this day, thou sh they shall be in thy heart. But see, this is what God's after. Always endeavor. He is after a heart transplant. He's after putting the word of God within you, or revealing himself within you, revealing his nature within you. So this is what he was after in the Old Testament. This is what he's after in the New Testament. He's never changed the dynamics of that. The only thing he has changed has been the method by which that's carried out. The difference in the two covenants is here, you know, God, God was well, had a commandment, and He wanted the folks to give their heart to it and give their, and get to know Him. In the New Testament, we have the Spirit of Sonship given to us in the New Covenant, the Spirit of Jesus Christ Himself given to us because we had end up in such a state of disobedience that the law had gotten so big and so momentous that no one could scale over it. So now an obedient one had to be provided to the to the degenerate hearts of mankind. This obedient one had to be uh, the spirit of sonship had to be supplied to us through the Son of God, and now we can keep the law by virtue of love, just as the original intention of the law was. The original intention of the law was to show the nature of God. And so the children of Israel just saw it as an ordinance. They just saw it as, oh, well, we can't do this and we can't do that. 
And see, if we view the law that, whether it's being the old covenant or new covenant, if we view the law as a set of ordinances, we miss the whole gig. Because God is after one thing. And that one thing is that you might know him in the inner man, experience him in the inner man, that the law be fulfilled in you. And so, here's what he said. And thou shalt teach from them diligently unto all thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Now this is referring to fellowship. It's saying, look, keep the things of God ever before you, because Satan, the roaring lions out here on the perimeter, trying to, to, to bring in the other elements of this life, the fears and anxieties and worrisome and, and, and lusts and, and, and greeds and, and, and all those things of this life, is always trying to get into the camp. So keep this conversation going. You know, that's why it's, the Bible says in the New Testament, exhort one another daily. While it is called today, except any of you, uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing, would, would be hard through the deceitfulness of sin. So this idea here is the same as it is in the New Testament. Get together, speak of the things of God, keep the things of God ever before you, keep them fresh, keep them vibrant, the living God, let him, let him move in the midst of your fellowship, in the midst of your union. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Remember, now remember here, this, this word being used here is as. They shall be as frontlets. So it's not that God wanted someone just to wear, you know, just want, wanted to wear the law, as a as a sticker, he didn't want the, them just to walk around with the law. He said, "As frontlets, meaning, look, let this be before you always. Let this let this be indelible in you. Let let this be rolling and moving and organic in you always. That 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 this is a living God that wishes to have this interaction with you internally, not externally." And when thou bind them as a sign upon thine hand, and as a frontlet between thine eyes, thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. That's like putting one of these up on the mirror, right? Put a, put a, put a, uh, a verse, people do it. Put Bible verses and they stick them up on the mirror. And so this this reminder, this, this to us in the New Covenant is read the Word of God. Keep your face in the Word of God. Keep your face in what God is saying, not what the world is saying what the media is saying, what the false church is saying, but what does God say? The, the importance of writing these things on the doorpost is meaning that remind yourself constantly where you're at, who you are, who you belong to. This is what a believer is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be walking in the constant revelation of God. Of course, that comes through prayer, it comes through the Word of God, and it comes through true, true biblical fellowship. And those three elements... Or is what keeps the church surviving, what keeps the church in the element of vibrancy. So there you have it. There's the mark of God and what it entails. Now, I want to move you into a more, even a more um, telling verse about this that a lot of people do not know exists. But this little verse here in Ezekiel is... Is referring to the mark of God again. Now this this comes in a vision to Ezekiel, and I'll start verse eight to give you a little backstory. So he's sitting before the children the, or the the, the um, hierarchy of Israel. This prophet Ezekiel, verse verse one of chapter eight, came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house before the elders of Judah. And the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. That I beheld, lo, the likeness is appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins downward, fire from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness and the color of amber. And he put forth the form of the hand, took me by the lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the heaven and the earth, and brought me in the visions, in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate, look at toward the north, which the seat of the image of jealousy, and which provoked it to jealousy. I want you to think about that, the image of jealousy. Now, the image of jealousy at that time uh, 
was likely an idol of some sort, whether it had been an idol of a, a, a Baal or an, some, some Egyptian god of some sort that they had brought into the house of God because there was quite a mixture going on in these days where they were, they were worshiping pagan gods under, under every grove and every green tree, uh, committing whoredom, as the Bible says, spiritual whoredom, which is actually just worshiping gods and God, trying to worship the, the living God and worship other things. You know, over in our covenant, that would that would be materialism or, or or people or anything outside of the true and living God, worshiping that creature more than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. So here, we have we have a, a vision that Ezekiel is able to see this this image of jealousy. Now keep that word in mind, image, as we go through this book because this this teaching because this is the important part of the mark that you must understand. So. Here he is. He's taken into the house of God by the Spirit in a vision. And we're going to jump over to uh, the ninth chapter and see what this vision entails. Now, there's other aspects of the vision in chapter 8. Not going to get into that. Just want to show you uh, chapter, chapter uh, 9, what's actually taking place here. Now, this is verse 1. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. I'm talking about the soldiers, the guardians of the city. Now this is a vision. This is not actual. This is a vision. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen and a rider's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood before the brazen altar. Uh, they're in the house of God. And the glory of God of Israel was gone out from the up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn in his side. Now here we go, friends. Rider, a picture of this. There's these soldiers, and then there's this one man that has an inkhorn. He has an inkhorn and probably a quill or whatever he might have used to dip into the ink to, to mark things with. He was a scribe, we'll say. And, and, it, and he said unto him, Go, this is verse 4, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now, what's going on here? Now, that, remember, this is a vision. This is not actually people walking around with ink on their head. It's not a visible mark. It's not an actual mark. This is metaphorical. So what's taking place here is God's telling Ezekiel, look, mark them who care about my ways. Mark them who are broken up over the condition of the church. Mark those who, who, who have a concern for, for, for my reflection in the earth. Mark them. And so, here's what happens. He says, to, and to the others, he said, in my hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite, let not thine eye spare, neither have you pity, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, which were before the house. So, see, judgment must begin at the house of God. So this is symbolic of God judging the church, which he's going to do very soon, by the way, in a very major way. So this is symbolic of him actually starting at the house of God and judging everything that's not like God. This would be the equivalent in the New Testament that when the, the, you know, our God is a consuming fire, and he's eventually, he's going to consume everything that is antichrist. He's going to assume everything, consume everything that's not like him, every bit of nature that's not like him, every bit of selfishness, every bit of hatred, every bit of anger, every bit of lust, every bit of greed. All these things that entail the nature of Satan are going to be burnt with, with, with the elements in fervent heat. And so here's what's going on here. There's a purging taking place of all things evil. And these, this is why he says, begin at my sanctuary. 
begin at my house because that's where it starts. It always starts there. And so this mark being a symbol of those who have the touch of God on them, who have the burden of the Holy Spirit on them. And, and as you can see in the vision, this is a symbolic, metaphorical mark. It's nothing to do with the physical mark, the vision. So here's what I'm going to propose to you. A mark in the Bible is not a physical mark. It is something that can be seen in the spirit realm. It is something that angels can see. It is something that angels can see when others can't see it. And it is a divine mark or an aura, if you will, upon the people of God that, that marks them and defines them among all the rest of God's creatures. So that when judgment is poured out in any situation, the mark of God is upon the children of, of, of obedience. So that when, when, the, when, when the, the wrath is poured out, when the execution is made of that pouring out of the wrath, then those are spared who have the mark of God on them. And so we see from the scriptures, this is not talking about an actual physical mark. So, so I'm going to ask you a question. So if, if the mark of, of, of God, if, if the mark of God is a spiritual symbolic mark, that's not necessarily something you can see. Then, now, if the mark of the beast is a computer chip, like a lot of people have, um, have proposed, or if it's a vaccine, as a lot of people have proposed, or, or any other physical mark, then what does the mark of God look like? I want you to think about that. And, 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 is, and is the mark of God... Um, Again, we're going to go into Revelation. We're going to look at this in a little more detail. So the mark of God, in fact, let's go there now because I think it's important to keep this in perspective. Revelation chapter 9. I'm going to read it. Chapter 9, verse 4. And it was commanded them. Now, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to, to chapter or verse 1. 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven and into the earth, and was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened up the bottomless pit. There arose smoke out of the pit, uh, uh, and, and smoke of great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them that were given, unto them were given power, as the scorpions of the earth, to have power. So in other words, power to sting, or power to, to, to paralyze, we'll say. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. That have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. Now, now that's a whole other whole other issue about the scorpions but the point here that I wanted to bring out was there is a mark and these and these marks are visible to spiritual creatures it's not people walking around with gold crosses on their head not people going around with with God inscribed in their forehead this mark is a spiritual mark this mark of God is a spiritual mark now imagine this mark of God let's say that it let's say that it is a physical mark let's say that Somehow you get a physical mark from God. Does, well, does, now, does a machine put it in there? Does it etch it in there? Or, or does a machine put a, a, a chip in your, your head and say, well, this is, this means you belong to God? Or does a needle, is a needle able to put God's mark in you? See, this is, this is talking about spiritual stuff, folks. We got, we got to understand this is, this is talking about, a mark identifying something in the spirit realm. Nothing to do with physical realm. So let us establish by these various and sundry scriptures that we have to be speaking about. Now, now of course, this mark here is referring to 144,000 that were sealed, right? We, we've heard that. And, and the, uh, the 144,000 who, I'm not going to get into who those might be and who those aren't, 
but but they also are, are given a mark and this mark is let me see if I can find it um, we know that they have a mark and this is the mark that we're referring to this is the mark we're referring to can't find it right off but this is the mark he's referring to over here in the uh, chapter 9 about about that mark in their forehead and then, you know mark mark those who belong to God and so this is a demonstration of how in the spirit realm there are spiritual marks on us and these these are these are things that are obvious to angels these are things that are obvious to God they may not be so obvious among human to human because now now you may have a glow about you if you're a Christian you should have a glow about you and I do believe that that glue that that glow will uh, ex exponentially increase as the hour gets darker and as mankind gets gets more uh, bent on the ways of Satan I believe the church will get brighter and brighter that's my always been my belief that she would become a glorious church and fulfill Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 where the Bible says that darkness shall cover the earth and dark gross darkness to people but the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon thee and his and his face and his power you know his glory shall be seen upon thee and you know so I do believe that there's going to be a a, a great separation a great um, uh, you know uniqueness about the people of God in the last day and possibly even having more of a physical glow than they've ever had possibly so that is something to consider that that this is a literal uh, this will be a literal fulfillment of Isaiah 60 the glory of God falling upon the church in such a magnitude that they, they will be seen as such and people will know those belong to God or those belong to Satan now this is what a mark means friends a mark is just simply the designation of something upon upon that recipient that receives that mark now so this mark this mark uh, could be akin if you really want to look at the allegory here it could be akin to uh, the mark in Exodus chapter 12 if you want to read it you can read it chapter 12 when uh, the children were brought out of Israel or out of Egypt and they were told to uh, on the on the Passover to slay the lamb the the, the, the young uh, lamb and to put the blood upon the doorposts of their house and this mark was the mark that they belong to the living God so the angels now think about this friends the angels came through and, and smote the firstborn in Egypt that's part of the plague, part of the judgment upon Egypt. And they did not differentiate by, on the basis of just you being an Israelite. They, they only differentiate uh, on, on the fact that, that the blood was on the doorpost and that was it. So it wasn't a matter of, well, I'm a Jew, I got it, I got it. I'm kicking back here, I got it made, you know. No, there was, so, there was a, proactive, a proactivity to it that God required them to do something. God required, look, put the blood up there because I'm not going to tell the angel the difference. This is going to be up to you to implement. And folks, this, this right here entails free will. This here, this here tells us that you know, the gospel from, from, the, from Genesis to Revelation is a free will response to an invitation. And no matter what anybody else says, no matter what anybody tries to concoct out of the verses, out of the Bible, to say that God does all the decision making, it's right here in a type that those people, although they were Jews, still had to apply this blood to the doorposts of their house. And so this, this is a type of us having to stay in the blood, under the blood of Jesus Christ, walking in the light as he is in the light and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin this is not automatic friends this is not you get saved one time and and then you just and then, and then that's it you're just declared righteous from there on out you've got to walk in the light you got to keep the blood on the doorpost that that is that is the that is the indication to the angels when they judge this earth that you are in Christ that mark see that that's symbolic of that mark 
that righteousness that you walk in, that righteousness that you walk in the spirit now in the new covenant is what keeps the angels of death at bay. You have to understand this, friend. So it's not just a declarative thing. You're not just a Jew, a spiritual Jew, and that's it. You've got to walk this out. You gotta, you got you gotta cleave unto righteousness. You gotta, you gotta let the holiness of God be birthed in you, and walk in the true righteousness of Christ. You can't be frivolous about it. And so, this mark is 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 really, this mark is to keep you from being judged. So when you see the the, the incidents in the in the New Testament and the Old Testament. When judgment passed over, it was because there was a mark upon them. And that mark represents that faithfulness of heart to God's word and God's ways. Now, I'm going to show you a little verse here in Ephesians that are also, in, we're coming over to the New Testament now. And I want to show you something here in Ephesians about the mark of God. We're still talking about the mark of God. We ain't gone to the mark of the beast yet. Stay with me. We're establishing what a mark is. Now, in this chapter 1 of Ephesians, the the uh this this is what he says this is verse 13 in whom you have trusted after that you have heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the holy spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the prey now what's the purchase pur purchase possession that is your soul, that is your body, that is your spirit. That's the whole thing. In other words, this, God has put a seal on you and his mark on you. And this mark is, is the Holy Spirit of promise, the meaning that when you receive the Spirit of God in you, it carries a promise in you. You know that you know that you know by, by the, the witness of the Spirit and by the full assurance of faith that you are one of his. This is not a declaration that's just hollow, this is an actual reality within you. You live and move and have your being in God. And that is that is actually carried out in a very real and dynamic way within you. This is not something declarative. This seal is actually vibrant and it's alive. It's not something that God just puts on you and then no worries. This seal is actually like, it, it's a mark of identification of those who are walking in righteousness. It's not just a seal that seals your fate and that's it. It's done. It's over. You got to walk this gospel. You got to walk with him. You got to walk in righteousness. The Bible's full of it. So you cannot just say, well, I'm sealed and that's it. It's over. Done. Doesn't matter what happens from here on out. It's nonsense. It's not what the Bible's entailing here. It just means a mark of ownership. It's all it means. It doesn't mean that you're sealed and it can never be cracked open again that it's a permanent seal and nobody nobody ever uh, can get into it or break into it again. It's just a mark. It's just a mark. That's all it is. A seal is a mark. A singlet. They would put that 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 singlet, a ring, in the in the and put it in that wax, that hot wax, and make a mark. The king's mark would be upon him. That's called a seal. And that seal was just an indication. This is who you belong to. They would do it with letters. They'd roll up a scroll. And they would roll up the scroll, and they and they would, you know, they would take, a, uh, just imagine this being a scroll. Probably didn't have lines. Probably wasn't yellow. They roll up the scroll, and they put the wax. This is a sticky note, by the way. They put the wax on this part right here where it folds, and that would hold. That would hold this shut. That wax would hold this shut. And, and then they would put their signet in it. In other words, this comes from the king. Don't open it until it gets to the recipient. So that's all a seal was, is a mark. So we have it over in the New Testament as well. This mark uh, of, uh, we have it in the book of Revelation. We have it in the book of Ephesians. We have this mark. So we've established that there is in fact a mark of God, right? So think about the four aspects of a mark. The four aspects of a mark is, one, it guarantees, now there's more than, than four, but these are the four basic ones. It guarantees the safety. In other words, when you have a seal on you, when you let's say you had a presidential seal, and you were going 
overseas and you had every you know you were sealed by the government so to speak and representing them then all the weight of the government is behind you if you're a delegate or or, or you know a uh, whatever whatever your um, your trip would entail whether it would be peacemaking or making deals with other countries financially whatever might be the case a delegate of some sort then you know a secretary of state whatever might be the case you have a seal on you and that seal is the seal of the U.S. government. That when you go, you are representing them. And therefore, they will back you. And if, that, if any country messes with you, then they have to mess with Big Brother. You know, it's kind of like the bully is behind what you do, but you're the one on the playground actually mingling with the children. So, but if you get in trouble, you can always call Big Brother. And, and so that's that's also guarantees your safety to have a seal on you. Now it's also a mark of ownership, just like just like that mark uh, on on uh, a physical delegate. You know he's owned. In other words, he's really the property of the United States. He's a citizen of the United States. He therefore belongs to the United States. And the only way he can get out of that is he'd have to change his citizenship through a process, a visa process, and all that sort of thing if he wanted to jump ship. But he can't just leave this country and belong to another. He belongs to the United States. And so, so it is with God. Whenever you become born again and the Lord Jesus Christ comes within, makes his dwelling place, then you become, you become basically his spiritual property. You are not your own. You are bought with a price, the Bible says. So meaning you have been redeemed unto him, a peculiar person redeemed unto him, that he who might be zealous of good works for him, as it says in the book of Titus chapter 2. And so, this mark has the mark of ownership, this mark has the mark of guarantee, and now this mark has the, 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 the mark of authenticity. Now, if you buy a product in a, in, a, in a common market, many times you'll see marks on them. You'll see identification marks on them, you know, whether it be guns or or whether it be bicycles, or whether it be cars, everything has an identifying mark on it. And that identifying mark means that it's authentically crafted and manufactured by that manufacturer. So when you look at a BMW mark, well, that's British Motor Works, right? Or Belgium Motor Works. So, so when, whenever you look at um, any mark, that is any product, whether it's a Schwinn bicycle or, or, or you know, food or whatever might be the case. When, when you see the word, the name of that company, that makes that often. Now, there's obviously fakes out there. There's obviously fakes of everything. We know that to be true. All you got to do is, is switch emblems around and make something look a little bit like something else and, and it can pass off. But, you know, the real connoisseur knows what's authentic and what isn't authentic. And that real connoisseur is God. And, and we'll get into this verse here in a minute, what, what, what this really means about authenticity. <clears throat> now, it also denotes, now it's number four, it also denotes a devotion, an allegiance, or a connection to the seal giver. Now, I want to read that again. It denotes a devotion, or an allegiance, or a connection to the seal giver. So, all the other aspects of that is, is, is from the seal giver. Now, this side of the thing is from the seal receiver. So, the seal of God and the mark of God upon your forehead, or on, your, on the frontlets of your, of your very being, and in your heart, means that you are devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are given to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have, you have an allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are connected to him by cohabitation. That the Lord himself has come in to live in your temple. And, and now you live and move and have your being in God, as it says in, in 1 Corinthians. So this union, divine union of your spirit and God's spirit, puts a mark on you. And that mark is seen by the angels and demons alike. So this is why I say often in my, in my chat rooms, you know, you're a marked person. If you're seeking God with all of your heart, then you're a marked man or a marked woman. Because these devils know, they, they, they can see the mantles of God, they can see the callings of God. 
They can see the propensities that you have. They can see the hunger for prayer that you can have. You have. You can see. They can see the hunger for the word of God that you have. They can see the hunger for truth that you have. And so their constant goal, twenty four seven, is to break that into you, break that in you, and, and and break down your will and break down your resolve to seek the living God with all of your heart. You're a marked person. If you're true, if you're a true seeker of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a mark on you. And everything knows it. Every spirit knows it. Every every spirit on the planet knows when you're marked of God. It's obvious to them. Because they see the aura and they see the operation of the spirit. Plus, they see the actual angels that you don't see. And the angels, the angels around you also denote the operation. You know the different the different aspects of angels, the different the different elements and the different ranks of angels concerning your particular mission also is indicative of what God has called you to do. You can't see those things. You don't have the ability to. But in the spirit realm, they know full well where 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 God intends to take individuals. They know full well. This is why when you press in for the fullness of God, this is why the fight intensifies. Because your mark becomes brighter and brighter. As as you seek God more earnestly, your bright your your mark literally begins to light up. And as they see it, as they see like the you know, like the Grinch who stole and his heart got bigger and bigger and bigger. And as your heart gets bigger and bigger for God and, and begins to swell for God, then then all them demons are gonna start gathering around. Because that's gonna make them nervous, that's gonna make them afraid, that's gonna make them uh, shaking their boots because they see a Christ forming in you. They see the Lord Jesus Christ becoming real big in you. And and when that happens, uh, look out for them. Bad news. And they know that. So those are the four aspects of, of a seal we have to consider. Again, safety, ownership, authenticity, and devotion. Those are the aspects of the seals. And so... So the seal of God is just simple, folks. The seal of God is the abiding presence of Jesus Christ. It's the abiding presence of God. It's not something God writes on you and then goes back to heaven and then you just live your own life. This this seal of God represents the fact that Christ is abiding in you. It, it's, it, there's no other seal. This is the only one. There's no There's no permanent seal. There's no seal that is just arbitrary on the part of God. There's no such thing. This is this is a reciprocating seal that the recipient must keep intact as well. It must keep that devotion, that heart devotion, devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that will keep the seal active. Now, right here in, in the th- in the twelfth chapter of um, the twelfth chapter of Revelation. <clears throat> This is in the 17th verse. Now, this is just a verse that I kind of pulled out here to show you something else about a seal. There's a lot of things around this verse that I don't want to get into. But but I, I just want to show you what, again, the seal. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now these these people that have the that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ is those who are are the ones that the dragon is after the one that Satan wants to destroy. Now who are these people? What is the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever considered what the testimony is? Now I'm going to show you what testimony is, and and this is. This is something that, that maybe you've never seen, maybe you have. But this is in the eight, the first chapter of Revelation, the 18th verse. This is when Jesus would appear to John and before he gave him the great book of Revelation. And listen what happens. This is the 17th verse. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Now, 
Folks, this is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is what, when, when, when the book says that in Revelation, the, the, the other uh, cha- verse here in Revelation chapter 17, or chapter 12, verse 17, when he says, they that have the testimony of Jesus, this is the testimony of Jesus, that I am alive forevermore. And I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And behold, I am. I have the keys of hell and death. So, <laughs> glory to God. So, what is the testimony? This testimony has to be alive in you. See, the, the Bible says that you have this testimony. Not that you speak this testimony. But that you have it. So, in other words, there's an abiding presence of God within those who have the seal of God in them. Those who have the mark of God on them will have true that will have true righteousness that actually manifests in the life. And this true righteousness will be unfeigned. This love will be unfeigned. It will be pure. It will be enduring. It will be it will be timeless. It will it will endure all things, hopeth all things, and loveth all things. And so this is the indication that you have the seal of God on you, is that you keep the testimony of the Lord and have the testimony of the Lord. So the seal and the testimony is, is the fact that Jesus is alive and he's alive in you and that he was dead and you died with him in that, in that death. And now you're alive and now you have the keys that God has given us the keys to unlock the, the, the unlock the prisons for those who are still in them. So these keys are given to us in that same sense. So here we go. So now I'm going to go over to Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to show you one more aspect of the seal of God. Because again, it's important to establish what a seal is. Or the, the rest of this is not going to matter to you. You're just going to blow it off as non-relative so we're going to look at all the aspects now there are many more in the book of God but these are the, the most fresh ones so chapter 8 verse 9 in Romans listen to this friends this is the seal of God but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be the spirit of God dwell in you now see, here's, what it, here's where the tire meets the road. The seal of God is only those who have the inner Christ. Period. Now watch this. He says, Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, then he is none of his. So in other words, this, this seal and this mark does not reply to those who are not walking in the Spirit. Those who are not walking in true divine righteousness this does not apply to them. There is no seal. There's no guarantee. There's no authenticity. There's no devotion. And there's no safety. And so we must realize that the only way that this seal works is if you have Christ dwelling within you. Not without. Not religion. Not paying homage to him in the outer perimeter and the outer perimeters of the temple. But that he dwells within you richly supplying and and providing his very nature and virtues within. If that is the case, then you are sealed with God. If you do not have that, then you are not sealed with Almighty God. There's just no two ways about it. If you do not have the Spirit of God, then you do you are none of his. Now some may out some may out there out there listen to him may say, well, you know, I know that I know that I'm right with God. Well, how do you know that? Now, if you tell me that you're right with God because you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, not enough, friend. If you tell me that you're right with God because you believe Jesus died on the cross, not enough, friends. The Bible says, as many as received him, gave he them the power to become the son of God. So you have to be declared a son by power, just the same way he was. You know that Jesus Christ was declared to be the son by, with power? 
and demonstration and the spirit of grace and truth fell upon him and anointed him and validated him before mankind. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so that same spirit of adoption must be dwelling in you, must be provided to you by the Holy Spirit. You must have the spirit of adoption in you, spirit of sonship that enables you to even cry, Abba, Father. You can't just believe this. You can't just have a mental assent to this. You must experience it by receiving the Spirit of God. No way around it. So, I think we well established what the seal of God looks like. That is, in fact, a spiritual seal. And it's something that angels see and God sees. And maybe with the aura that we are to carry in these last days, other folks will see it as well. I mean, I, I mean I've mean, i had people say that to me over the years. Man, you, you, know, you look different. You look, you know, what's this about? What about you? What, what, what's different about you? There's something going on here. So there is a sense. It's almost like, it's almost like a dog whistle in a sense. You know, they can hear it, they, but they don't really know where it's at. You know, there's that, that sound way off. You see the dog turning their head, trying to tune into that sound or whatever it might be where they get confused and they do the head turn trying to adjust them ears just right. And that's the way it is with folks out in the world. Sometimes they just know something different about this cat, something different about this woman. And that's the mark of God, see. And so we've established what the mark of God is. So let us continue with the mark of the beast. This is where we get into the meat of the thing. Mark of the Beast. Now, again, many people have many different theories on this, what the Mark of the Beast is, and whether or not it's a, a physical mark, a, a vaccine. Uh, it seems like about every few years, we have another idea what the mark is. We have another idea that, uh, you know, it's, it's a computer chip, or it, you know, it's a, uh, it's a card, or or it's a, uh, it's a vaccine, which was put in the left hand arm anyway. So that, that's already out of the question. But see, all these things, friends, let, let me just explain to you some, something here, especially if you're American. Now, I don't know how they do this in other countries. I assume they do something along these lines. I'm not a citizen of the world or, or, or a student of the world, so I couldn't tell you. But I can tell you, in our own culture... Our own country, our own country. You are, you come out of the oven. You come out of the oven, so to speak, with a mark, and that's that's inevitable. Doesn't matter who you are. If you're you're in the hospital and you're born of a woman, you have a mark called a social security number. Everybody gets one in this country. Don't matter. Now there there may be a handful of people that don't have them, but they're they're probably born in the mountain somewhere and and, and never see civilization. That could be the case. There could be people that are not accounted for. That could be the case. And I'm sure there are some. But but that that does not negate the fact that we already have a mark on us. We are born with a mark. We have an identification mark that that we use to get licenses, that we use to get uh, marriage licenses, we use to get auto licenses. I mean, you name it. You have to present the Social Security because... That social security number says, I am a citizen, I pay taxes, and this is where I live. And so that identification mark means that you are property of the United States of America. Anybody understand that? So the physical mark's already there. So we can put that aside, put all the fears aside. Government knows who you are. They know where you are. They know what you're doing. You probably know you're watching this. I mean, there's the technology now is 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 coming right. In, I mean, it's in your hands, friend. You're 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 carrying your replica of yourself in your hands right now. You know, you have you have a replica of who you are right here. And you and everything that you do and everything that you love and everything that you involve yourself in, every person you know, is right here in this data bank. So you are known as fully as you know. By 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 any entity that wants to intrude upon your privacy, it is that it is at their fingertips. You understand that, right? So so just forget about that. 
the idea that that you can be controlled by a vaccine or you can be controlled by a number under you're already controlled you're already under control so we're going to look at the word of god about what the mark actually is and what it really means to have a mark now i gotta find my paper here <clears throat> Where am I at? Number three. Yeah, so the mark of the beast. Let's talk about the mark of the beast. So the mark of the beast, Revelation chapter 14. We've got to go get the exact verse so we don't have any discrepancies. Now here it is. Verse 9, chapter 14. And third, the, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, in his forehead or in his hand. Now remember what I established with you first of all, that the mark of God was in the forehead and in the hand. Right? And we determined that that was devotion to God, the frontlets, and reminder that, that God brought us out with a strong hand. So this, this is actually a perversion of that. So this mark that, that this false religion puts upon people is simply a mockery of the mark of God. Now follow me, friends. It's important you follow this. Now they receive a mark on their forehead and in their hand. And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and the presence of the Lord. Lamb and the smoke of his torment ascending up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night who worship the beast and his image. Whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And here is the patience of the saints. And here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, I want you to hear this, friends, very importantly. Very, very important you hear this. So what is the distinction here between those who worship the beast and those who have the faith of Jesus? So we have to go back to our original point that the Christian has an indwelling God in them. They have an indwelling Christ. They have, they have the, the full assurance of faith and the conscience that their spirit bears witness with God's spirit that they are a child of God. So they have within them, listen to me, they have within them the faith of the Son of God. Now those without in the beast system may have faith on the Son of God or faith about the Son of God or faith towards the Son of God. But those who walk with God have the faith of the Son of God. And they're able to keep the commandments. Why? Why? Because he who is the embodiment of commandments is living within them. So as God fulfills his own commandments within you, you have the very faith of the Son of God because he is dwelling in you and he is your helper and he is the one who helps you believe and he is the one that infuses his very faith in you. That's why every man must receive a measure of faith. Now, so we see the distinction here is about having the, the actual indwelling Christ as, dis as distinguishing from they that only have a, a fake mark or a fake understanding or a topical understanding of God. Now, we'll see, this, we'll see this distinction begin to get wider and wider here as we go on. So, this word image, the beast in his image, have you ever thought about the image? Now, a lot of people think that's, you know, that's compute the great supercomputers and, you know, there's all these these theories about what the image is. <clears throat> but I'm going to show you from the Bible what the image really is. Now, this word image, in the Greek, it's ikon, E-I-K-O-N, and it means, this is what it means, listen to me closely, it assumes a prototype, which not, re not, which not really resembles, but from which it is not only, let me read this again, which not only assumes a prototype which not only re resembles, but from which it is drawn also. In other words, it, it has 
within it, not just something uh, that looks like something, but something is passed between the things. So we're talking about a spiritual dynamic here. So this image is actually organic. It's not something that's just a statue. Not just a statue of an antichrist somewhere sitting in a temple. This has to do with something organic. This is, this is a replication of something that is false. And so the image, I'm going to take you over into the book of Thessalonians, or Timothy, and I'm going to show you another verse about this image and what it is. Now a lot of people know this verse, very popular verse, but seldom do you hear it talked about in this vein, if ever, if I ever, ever heard it talked about in this particular vein. This is in the third chapter of 2 Timothy, very popular verse. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, abusive, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of them that are good, tready, high, trady, traitors, high-minded, heady, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Now, watch this. Having a form of godliness, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now, I'm going to tell you what this word form means. The form befitting the thing or truly expressing the fact, the very form of it. So, here's what we're, here's what we're getting down to, friends. There is, there is a mock-up of God in the earth. There is a mockery of God in the earth. That which looks like Christianity, that which looks like a true, vibrant relationship with God, but it is only an image. It, it's a form. So it, it is actually just a facsimile. It's not the real bona fide material, but it's just a copy, as if you would take an original of anything. You know, if you found an original uh, Declaration of Independence and, you know, actually signed by the fathers of, of the country and you were to put it in your, uh, I have one right here, uh, a copy machine, even the finest copy machine in the world, and you were to push copy and that copy would be spit out. I mean, you may even try to mimic the paper, use the same thickness of paper, and you may even try to make it look dated. And, but it's not going to be the exact of the replica. It's, not, it's only going to be a replica. It's only going to be a facsimile, no matter what you do with it. Because it has nothing in it of intrinsic value. It has nothing with, within it the qualities of originality. Therefore, it's just going to be a spinoff or a prototype or something that looks like the original. So see, friends, this is what the image of the beast is. The image of the beast is a copycat religion that looks like Christianity, it functions like Christianity, but it has no inner substance. So therefore, it is just a form. Now notice what he says here in 2 Timothy. He says, he names off all these sins that would be in the last days in religious people. Because he goes on to say, these have a form of godliness. In other words, they look like you know, they look like, you know, get a good picture of them because they look like the people of God. But these inner ills that, that, that I'm expressing here has not been taken care of in them. In other words, they've denied the power of change. They've denied the power of transformation. They've denied the power of regeneration. And they only have a form of godliness. But they still love this world. They still love pleasure. They still are disobedient. They are still without natural affection. All these things are still a part of them when they're espousing from their lips that they know God, but by their works, they declare that they know not God. And so Paul is saying, from such turn away. Now, if you'll, if you'll listen to me, this is the same thing that's echoed in the 18th chapter of Revelation when the apostle, Jesus tells the apostle, to tell the church, come out of her, my people, and receive not of her plagues. The woman, the whore, this spiritual system that is a mimicry of the Lord Jesus Christ's church has a mark that she puts on you. And that mark 
is the fact that you you are willing to pay for her intimacy through your own works. And the Christian, the true born-again Christian, has the power within them to deny these things that are listed in the second chapter or the third chapter of 2 Timothy. So the true Christian will be pure of these things, but the religious person under the tyranny and umbrella of the great whore will only have a nominal expression of who God is and word only. They will not have the power to change the inner man. Do you see it? So the mark of God is the fact that Christ dwells within. The mark of the beast is a religious mark of all of those who are outside of the faith of Jesus Christ and do not keep his commandments. So really, friends, this is what it comes down to. Everyone on this planet has the mark of the beast on them already. That's already on them. If they're in this world and they know not Jesus and they do not have the dwelling, indwelling Christ, if they've not been born again or regenerated, they are under the beast system. Whether or not they're an active state of religion or whether or not they're an atheist or whether or not they're a Catholic or whether or not they're a Mormon, whether or not they're a Muslim, whether or not they're Hindu, they're all under the power of the beast system. And because this beast system just has one earmark to it, trying to get to God in their own power. The Christian has God revealed to them by power, declared the Son of God by power. And as many as received him, gave he them the power to become the sons of God. So the difference between a Christian and the other religions of the world is the inner power and strength of righteousness. That the Lord Jesus Christ himself takes up residence. So the mark of God, remember, the mark of God is the indwelling Christ. The mark of the beast is a system that's, that is outside of the economy of God that operates in the commerce of good works, flattery, and, and, and philanthropic reasoning, and, and, and charity, and all these things that are expressed from the human condition that do not have in them the intrinsic power of the Holy Spirit, nor do they have the revelation of who Jesus is, nor do they have the testimony that he is risen from the dead because they do not have the power of the resurrection within them. And, and demons believe in God and they tremble, but they do not have the intrinsic power and goodness and greatness of a holy God. So this form or this image has to do with a reflection of, a reflection of that beast system, of that antichrist system, as that substitute for Jesus. So what is what? So what is the beast? So the beast is is a system. Now I'm going to go over here in, in the book of Daniel. We got we got some time to go. So everybody, hope y'all hope y'all are dug in. So this beast is in Daniel chapter seven. I'll jump over to Daniel real quick. Chapter 7, Lord help me. Now I'm going to read this for Daniel chapter 7, verse, well I'm going to go ahead and start at verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions in his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the, some of the matter. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision in the night, behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four beasts came out of the sea, diverse from one another. Now, he goes on and says the first beast was like a lion, uh, and, and uh, eagle, had eagle's wings, and behold, the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet, and behold, the second beast like a bear, third beast was like a uh, leopard and after this uh, there was a beast with that had four heads and dominion was given over to it so so these beasts okay they represent it and if you go on and read you could you, you're welcome to go on and read it and, and look at it yourself but these beasts represented different kingdoms that were in place the Medo-Persians the, 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 the Greeks and and the uh, um, the Babylonians 
and the Romans. So all these kingdoms represented something uh, that was already happening or would happen. You know, Rome being the one that was prophesied at the time of Daniel, but Babylon and the Medo-Persian and the Grecians, I think were already um, already in place. Yeah, and then I think that's right. And then, and then Rome would finish out the dispensation. But so, and if I'm wrong on that, uh, somebody can correct correct that in their own uh, their own study. But then I'm gonna jump over verse 17. Listen, these these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall rise out of the earth. So a beast is a kingdom. So understand this, friends. We're establishing the mark of the beast. So the Bible establishes that beasts are kingdoms or kings or, or rulerships, if you will. And so this kingdom, can, these kingdoms can be uh, spiritual or they can be physical or they can be spiritual and physical combinations. Now watch this. Watch this. This is very important. So this, this verse 23, same chapter 7 of Daniel. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be of the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Now this is talking about the Roman Empire. Now the Roman Empire would be diverse from all others. In other words, different from all others. And, and she would be, now this word diverse means to be changed or transformed. So it's interesting the way this is, this, this, this plays out here, friends. I want you to think about this for a minute. So, you know, the, 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 the power of Rome and the earth during the time of Jesus was the superpower, right? We all know that. The Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD and tore it down and threw everything down and stole all the artifacts and plundered and pillaged the city. We know that by history. And, you know, this was a fulfillment of Jesus prophesying, not a stone here will be left upon uh, another. So we know that was a prophesied occasion that took place. But this, this, Roman, this Roman power, which it would eventually come to naught in the world, would eventually, like all superpowers do, come to nothing in, in the world because nobody can rule the whole world. It's just too, it's too impossible to rule the whole world. Because there's too much diversity. There's too many, too much water in between us. There's too much. Uh, there's too just too many factors involved in trying to rule the world. So eventually, Rome's kingdom would would come down. Now, here's what happened, folks. Here's what happened. She would diversify. In other words, she would be changed into a spiritual kingdom. So this kingdom, being diverse, would would go away in its superpower but it would morph into a spiritual superpower. And this spiritual superpower would take on the form of the papacy, take on the form of a Catholic universal church. Now, there's a lot of history about this that anybody can look up, with Const starting with Constantine and around 300, early 300s, all the way to uh, you know the Council of Trent and, and, and all the way to um, in 19... Or, or, or 528 is when this actually kicked off to be an official military and spiritual mixture, this diverse kingdom of Rome. She'd be a spiritual and, and, and physical kingdom, military power, and, and this was in the 500s now, and, and she would also become a spiritual power. She'd become the universal head of the, of the, of the church in the world. So this beast, now, this this ten kingdoms, watch this, I'm going to show you something else here in Daniel that's very interesting. Stay with me. A lot of information. If you got to rewind it, rewind it. So here in the book of Daniel, the, the king saw a vision, and here's Daniel interpreting the vision. This is chapter 2, verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. And this image's head was of fine gold, a breast as the arms of silver, and a belly as... Now this is the vision that I told you about later on in the seventh chapter that would be interpreted by Daniel. 
and and it, and God would show him that these are the kingdoms, the different kingdoms. So every part of this great statue represents a different kingdom. So follow me. His legs were as iron, his feet was 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 of iron and mixed with clay. This is the interesting part. See, this iron and mixed with clay represents the Roman Empire, who would become a mighty fortress, but then would soften. But she would have a mixture of spirituality in with her military. So this mixture of iron and clay would represent a mixture of religion and politics. Now, thou sawest till thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, and that they were that that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away. No place was found for them. The stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dragon, and he will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Or this is the dream, not the dragon. This is the dream, and he will show, show the interpretation. Thou, O king, art a great king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the earth, given unto the hand, hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art the head of gold. In other words, you're, the, you're this first empire. You're, 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 the, you're the, the, the great power. Now, so I was wrong about that when Daniel was actually prophesied. This was, I was thinking of Revelation, sorry, that Roman Empire was contemporary in the book of Revelation. And so I got a little mixed up there. So I have to correct myself. So these shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. And another third kingdom shall rise. And a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. It's talking about the, the, the Romans uh, of iron. For as much as iron breaketh to pieces and subdueth all things. As iron that breaketh all these shall, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of the potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So, here we go. So here he's talking about the mixture. And the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, and the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So we see that you know, when we, and we can see that, friends, in, in the papacy, that, yeah, it has influence all over the world and the fact that it, it, has, um, it has great political influence. But there's powers behind it, see. There's powers behind it that are not physical. And now, the, you know, it's, it's also weak in that it doesn't really have any military prowess. I mean, it cannot, it couldn't fight its way out of a paper bag as far as its, its military might goes as far as against superpowers of this world. Now, it is part of a bigger system uh, of Europe, but it's within itself, it has, has no intrinsic superpower status. So it's weak, but yet it's strong in its effect all over the world, its diversity, how it controls so many different elements of the universal church all over the world. So think about that, this thing called Rome. And... In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Of course, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this, this was showing, this vision was showing what was taking place with the vision that, or this interpretation was showing what happened with the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. And so the ten kingdoms of, well, wait a minute, let me go on here a little bit. 45. Days of the kings, God of heaven, so that which never be destroyed, the kingdom shall be left. Other people shall break in pieces. No, lost it. So these ten kingdoms, that and, and I got to look at a little video here before um, I can go on with this. So give me a second. Got to look up something here. So this this you know this dream talks about the um, you know this last this last um, kingdom being one that's diverse and it would have it would have ten I'm not sure where this is I can't remember where I've lost it 
wherever I had it before, but I'll just paraphrase. So this kingdom would have uh, 10 horns. We know that there'd be 10 horns and, uh, and then, then it would be down to uh, one horn would raise up and subdue three and then it would be uh, back down uh, to one horn would, well, I wish I could find that because now I can't remember where it is. Should have wrote that down. So Babylon being the head of gold, beast in the arms being Medo-Persia, belly and thighs being Greece, the legs of iron being Rome, and the feet of iron would be uh, the, the Rome, uh, or the, yeah, the feet of iron would be Rome uh, and modern Europe mixed together, which, by the way, are these ten kingdoms that the Bible speaks of, and I can't for the life of me remember where that's at, but you can look it up, easy to find. These ten kingdoms represent Europe in a, in, in a post-500, uh, in, in the year 538, is when she would officially be, be called uh, a superpower, or, or not a superpower, but at that time would be, be called a, a, an entity of power, declared to be power, mixed with the papacy. So this is when this happened, 528. And this particular, let me look it up here. A lot of information here I'm trying to. So these 10 kingdoms would be, uh, considered the Saxons, who would end up being the English, the Franks, that would end up being the French, the, the Al Alemanni, who would end up being the Germans, the Visigoths, which would end up being the Spanish, the Suave, end up being the Portuguese, the Lombards, end up being the Italians, the, the Bergelinians, end up being the Swiss, the Herule, the Vandals, and the Aust Ostrogoths. Now, these three last ones are the ones who the Her Herule, however you want to say it, Herule, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths were all those who would hold out. They would hold out through uh, the late four 400s and into the early 500s. They would hold out against the papacy becoming a military power. So they would say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to let you become a church and state. This is not this is not how the church should be involved in the affairs of man. They should be separate. And they kept insisting that Rome would be ruled by a papacy. And so this was pushed and pushed until the point where these folks basically become extinct by rule, by the domineering effect of the other seven. And the fact that, that, that they finally were, were overcome. And in 538 AD, this is when it would become official that these these three factions would be eliminated. So so there was ten, and then then one rose one rose. In other words, the whole union of the other seven said, "Look, we want the papacy to be a military power," and it, it eliminated the three. So the horn rose up and got rid of the other three. This happened in five twenty eight. Yeah, I believe that's right. Five twenty eight. And so we're, we've, we've determined now that we're talking about the beast, the beast being a government system that facilitates a woman. So a government system that facilitates a woman. Now I hope you're keeping up with all this. I know it's a lot of information. You can, you can go back and watch it again. <sighs> quite, quite taxing to try to get it all in. So what are we after here? What are we actually trying to find out here? What, where did this woman come from? Where's the original uh, in, intent of Satan to develop this this religious superpower? What was his intention of doing so? And how did he pull it off? And, and all such things. And there's a timestamp here. Let me look at it here in this video that I got pulled up. And I'm going to show you something else here. So I'm going to read it. So the Herguli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoth were successfully destroyed by the papacy, which fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel 7.24, which is, okay, there's the verse I was looking for, sorry. Uh, Daniel 7.24, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another, which is the papacy, shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue 
three kings. So there you have it. I mean, it's black and white. So the papacy rises up out of out of the you know out of the, this kingdom and ends up getting a papal throne and the government blended with religion, diversity. Remember, mixture, iron and clay, and and formed this monstrosity called the universal church. And so this was all this was all a plan of Satan to bring together a controlled religion, a religion that would that would be exterior, a religion that would that would be a form of godliness, denying the power thereof, that would be a facsimile of the true and living and enduring gospel of Jesus Christ. And she would become great and she would become she would become a monster. She would become an ecumenical monster in all of the earth. And she would she would literally take over the word church. Either, she, I mean, she would hijack the word church and turn it into a, a, a strong arm, powerful, uh, a subdued thing that, that, that would be controlled by one person at the helm called a pope. And he would delegate this power out. And this, this papacy would become the ruler over the earth of religion. Now think about it, friends. This this is this is a this is a beast. This is what a beast looks like. It's it's this it's is it is the beast of religion. And so this beast facilitates a woman. So the beast being the political system or the kingdom, and the woman riding upon the beast is the religious system that is actually using the government as its mode of transportation. So it is a woman that rides upon a beast. Now, before you, you know, before you think I'm picking uh, exclusively on the Catholic Church or the Universal Church, I am not. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you that this entails any form of religion, this, this beast. Now, she's not just, she's just not limited to uh, the Catholic Universal Church. She's limited She's, she's unlimited. She's so big. She's, she has her influences all over the earth. This can, be, this can be on a larger scale like the papacy. This can also be on a much smaller scale as a denomination. Anything, anything that facilitates and tries to put God in a box and make him controllable, this is part of the beast system. Doesn't matter what your denomination is called. Don't matter if you're if you're Protestant or Catholic. If you have a system that limits God because of doctrinal decree, because of because of uh, uh, of creeds, because of institutes, because of anything that's been implemented through the desk of man, that have come from the desk of man and not from the divine revelation, is part of the beast system. So we, we can't limit this to just the Catholic Church. This thing has its influence throughout all the world. Remember, she's a mother of harlots, and therefore she has a lot of babies. And these babies are born every day. They're born every day in the thoughts and ideologies of man, formulated in the back rooms of religion, instituted in the basements of denominational thinking. And each one of them are producing the offspring of facsimiles of God. Each one of them are producing a look-alike of the real. And when this, when this woman puts her mark on you, the mark, the, the mark of this beast, when she gets her mark on you, then you are connected to a system that is a system of spiritual prostitution. Now what does that mean? It's called a great whore. That means that you give something to her whether it's your good works or, you know, your church attendance or, you, you know, signing a card and being a membership or paying money to it. This is all part of her commerce. This is all part of her giving you spiritual intimacy like a whore, like a prostitute. She's giving you spiritual intimacy for you paying for it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a relationship by default, meaning there's a marriage. And this marriage is you become the bride of Christ by receiving the Spirit into your heart. And that translates you into the kingdom of his dear son. And when you're translated into the kingdom of his dear son, you become part of the bride of Christ. 
And then the spiritual intimacy that you enjoy with God comes through the Spirit. Does it come by what you do? Doesn't come by what you don't do. Don't come by how much money you make. Doesn't come by how much how many hands you shake. Doesn't come by whose back you pat. It don't come by whose pockets you pad. It only comes by a true and endearing relationship with God as transferred through the Spirit of God alone. Everything outside of this is part of the beast system. And that mark is the mark of good works. That mark upon the forehead is a, is, is a homage to a religious system that does not afford you spiritual intimacy outside of you paying for it. That's called the mark of the beast. So, so this this mark that that this this woman puts on your head, it comes for you joining her in matrimony. You joining her in a false sense of matrimony. Whether you become part of this religious system through, as I said, through money, through membership through homage to a denominational thinking. You could even have this, this beast system in your local non-denominational church. You can have this system in there just as well as you can in the, in the papacy. It doesn't matter how big it is. What matters is the mindset. If you have the mindset that you have God in a box and that you have God cornered in this ideology, this is the way we believe. This is the way we're going to do this. This is the way we're going to do that. And you don't let God into the equation by the influence of his Holy Spirit, you are a part of the Antichrist system. And you have that mark on your head. Folks, this has nothing to do with buying groceries. Listen to me very closely. This has nothing to do with you buying groceries in the earth. This has nothing to do with you paying your bills. This has nothing to do with your privileges being revoked as a citizen. This has everything to do with a spiritual economy. Remember what Jesus would say in the third chapter of Revelation. Buy of me gold, which is tried in the fire. Now this gold that's tried in the fire, that is the faith of Jesus that we talked about earlier. This faith that's already been tried. This faith has already been found to be true. This, this faith is already found to be devoted to his Father. So he says, buy of me gold. My gold, this is the commerce of heaven. By faith, receive the power of the Spirit. By faith, receive the virtues of Jesus Christ. Walk in righteousness by volition of the Spirit. Receive of that goal. See, that's the commerce of heaven. But see, the commerce of religion is you buy it with your works. The commerce of heaven, come and buy that have no money. So the only way you get anything from heaven is you come with empty pockets. You say, I ain't got nothing. And then God can give you his faith. That if you come in the power of your own volition, in the power of your own works, in the power of your own righteousness, in the power of your own goodness, then you'll just be a part of the beast system. And you'll get, your, you'll get that mark on you. And see, when judgment begins to come in the earth, you won't be marked. You won't have the mark of God. You have the mark of the woman on you. You have the mark of the harlot on you. So the angels will judge you at that time. If you do not have the inflowing, indwelling power of Christ within you. So listen, this government starts in 528. I'm going to read it. Let me find it here. I've got to find it in my timestamp because i got this video up here. Whee. So this woman is... It, it, again, this, this woman is in, in uh, Revelation chapter 17. Let me just read it real quick. We've got a little ways to go. Everybody hang tight. It's a lot of information, I know. And I'm sure I'm missing a lot of things. And I'm sure I'm not covering them just uh, thoroughly. And I may be, uh, you know, not, not uh, recalling in my memory just exactly what uh, but the details that I want to... Uh, um, Recall, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. That's what we're after here. Now, who is this woman? This is Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. And he carried me away in the, the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, there's the seven heads and the ten horns, which is talking about the ten kingdoms who would, who would you know, emerge. And I read them all off to you, ten kingdoms of Europe, and then it will be down to, to, to the seven. 
And so the Bible clearly portrays uh, the people of God as a woman. Do you know that? Do you know that the, 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 the Bible, I mean, we've got to establish the woman thing here because this is what, this is the other important factor here. And we talk about the woman being the false church, but I want to show you in the book of God what a woman is in, in the true sense of the word. This, so m most of you know this, but some of you watching may not know that the people of God are referred to as a woman. Now here it is in Jeremiah chapter 6. I'm just going to read one verse. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So, so whenever God speaks of her and the Bible, her, 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 her uh, uh, being Israel in the Old Testament, whenever he speaks of her, he's referring to his, his, the, the one that he's espoused himself to. The, the nation of Israel was considered his bride or his woman because she was married to him in a spiritual sense. So you have to understand that. First establish that. Now, if we go over into the New Testament, again, a lot of you Christians already know this, but uh, there may be people watching that don't. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. This is what it says. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So there you have it. So, so we're talking about a marriage. We're talking about a, a, a bride. The church is called the bride. Israel was called the woman of God. So again, so the woman represents a spiritual union. So you got that. You follow me. So, so the whore, uh, the great whore, that in, in Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 18, this great whore is a substitute or a mockery of that matrimony that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this whore is, you know, she's committing fornication with the kings of this earth. You all know what that means. That means that she's, she's a politically motivated and politically involved power that has not only religious influence, but a governmental influence over many all over the world, a, a diverse a diverse spiritual kingdom, a universal kingdom that influences the whole earth and, and has, you know, the, the Catholic Church has 1.3 billion people in it. I think that was the last estimate I saw. 1.3 billion. I mean, that, that, that's a mega church if I've ever seen one. You see, this influence all over the world is indicative of her power and her persuasion over mankind. Now, see, she takes, she takes, again, I covered this earlier, she takes the payment of homage and servitude and self-righteousness as her currency. You don't actually have the spiritual intimacy of being born of the Spirit and God coming in and living in His temple. Instead, you go to a temple and there you try to experience God in the temple. That's why, friends, there's a lot of religious experiences in these places. There's religious experiences in these and these, and these synagogues, because there are spirits. And these spirits are the dirty birds, the foul birds that it talks about in the book of Revelation, the caged birds, because they're kept in that religion, and they hold men in religion. And so they are caged. They are, they are actually uh, lo they are located in a certain element of religion. And when you get in there, you also get locked into it. You get caged in. You get... You get held in to her, her vices and to her, her, her talons, so to speak, this dirty bird. And so we've established that the church is a woman, Israel is a woman, and now we have a whore woman. It's a substitute for the intimacy of God. That's what an antichrist is. Antichrist spirit is a spirit that is a substitute of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a spirit of religion. What else could it be? It's a strong delusion because people love righteousness and, and have not the love of the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion. Why is a strong delusion allowed to happen? Because people 
refuse the true righteousness, which is the indwelling Christ, and they, cho they choose to, do, to use their own servitude. So God sends a strong delusion, which is a false sense of, of salvation, a false sense of, of being in right standing with God, when in fact you have no virtues, you have none of the fruits of God's Spirit, you have none of the elements of His nature, but yet you have in name, nominal, you have confessed and professed this thing towards God, but you have no power within yourself. There's nothing that's been transferred to you. And, and any experience that you've had that have not produced righteousness, that if you've had an experience that, is, that you consider supernatural or tingly or, or hair-raising, and, and it's not produced righteousness in you, then you can be assured, friends, this is a false spirit that's connected to the Antichrist spirit. You can be assured of it. Because the spirit of Christ will do one thing distinctly different from all other spirits. It will produce righteousness in you. You will love what is right. You will love what is good. You will love what is pure. You will love what is holy. You will love what is just. You will love what is honest. You will love what is of good report. This will be the virtue and testimony of the person who meets the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's think about this mark, right? This mark. Now I'm going to jump over here to the 13th chapter. This is where people get all balled up. It's where they get all balled up. Revelation chapter 13, verse 17. There's so much I want to cover. I should really make this like a month-long series. And here it goes. And he, he, and he causeth all, this is verse 16. And he causeth all, both small, great, rich, and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, isn't it interesting, interesting the way this is laid out, buy or sell? Now, most people have interpreted this to mean that this means you can't buy or sell in commerce. You can't buy or sell at the local grocery store. You can't buy or sell at Walmart, whatever might be the case. But this, folks, but this is talk. This is talking far beyond groceries. This is this is talking about. This is a spiritual book. This is talking about spirituality. This is talking about the dynamics of the spirit world. Not talking about your groceries. So you have to understand that. Don't don't carnalize the things of God by putting. A, a carnal interpretation to it. So, how did this woman, we're going to talk about the buy and sell in here in a minute, but how did this woman, um, how did she come about? As I told you, in 538 AD, this uh, this woman, watch this, so I'm, I'm going to show you something, I'm going to read you something out of this video. Very interesting. Let's see, 1640. 1640. Hang with me. So we know that the ten kingdoms, the three fell, and then in 538, this is when this other kingdom emerges. And, or, you know, the full papacy emerges in 538. 538. So listen to this. I'm going to read you. This is history now. This is not my opinion. This, this is in 538 AD. Vigilus, uh, this was a pope, ascended the papal chair under the military protection of Belisarius. So this was, this was when uh, the military, the Roman military and, and, and the papacy combined to form a government blended with the state. This happened in 538 AD. I want you to keep that number in mind because it's very significant. This is when the actual mixture of church and state took place. And so, at, I mean, there were there were elements of it up to that point. Constantine, three, 300 and I think 13 to 30, somewhere around in there. And then uh, at the end of the, of, of the fourth century, there was another uh, attempt to 
to brand the government with with the uh, church, but it still it wasn't really totally successful until 538 when this would happen. When this I said 28 earlier, I correct myself. When this would happen, and it would be obvious to all that now Rome, coupled with a religious power, would become a state religion. So this is when it officially took place. And so, at this time, those rebels, those three rebels that rose up and said, no, we don't want you, we don't want there to be a papacy and, you know, mixed with the government, this is when they would be stomped, stamped out and then the seven would arise. So the three horns were, were taken out by this, by this, just like the prophecy says. So, we're, we're right on par here. We're right on par. So Revelation, now I want to show you another interesting thing here. This is also mind-blowing. This is in Revelation. This is uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. And, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads, now this is the seven heads on the beast, remember. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So this woman, this woman being the religious system, sats upon a mountain, seven mountains, in this kingdom. Do you follow it? So you have a woman, religious system, sitting upon a kingdom, upon seven mountains. Now, watch this. This is another, this is another very interesting statistic. I mean, these, this is all historical stuff, by the way. You can, you can look it up uh, online. It's very much available. So, here's what it says. This document is a document about Napoleon. It says, when, when Napoleon, or no, this is not Napoleon. This is something else. So, it is written, it is within the city of Rome called the Seven Hills. The city of the seven hills. That's what Rome's called. The city of the seven hills. The entire area of the Vatican state property is not proper is now confined upon seven hills. So think about that, friends. So here's the name of the hills: Palatine, Capitoline, Quirinal, Viminal, Esquiline, Saline, and Aventine. Together they span about 110 acres. So it is within the city of Rome that that. Uh, called the city of seven hills, the entire area of the Vatican is now confined. So think about that. So there again, we have another confirmation of this woman being on the seven hills. Now, uh, so let's go here a little bit. So so listen, this is what happens. This is what happens. So. Uh, in 1798, now she would rule from 538, this, the papacy, would roll from 538 until 1798. That's 1260 years. Anybody know what that number is? What that number is about? 1260 years. Now, now the, the Bible mentions here in Revelation chapter 12, got to stay on... Stay on my thought here. I got so many things rolling around in my head right now. Stay with me. A lot of facts here. So this woman, when the dragon saw that he was cast upon the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man child. And the woman, the woman was given two two wings uh, of an eagle. She might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time, and a time, and a half a time, from the face of the serpent. Now, I want to tell you something, friends. That time and time and half a time is 1260 days. Now, in Bible prophecy, it's well known that a day represents a year. So, you know, in the book of Daniel, it talks about times and talks about days referring to years. The ancient of days, you know, as a day is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. So, so what he is saying here is 1260 days, 1260 years that this this woman would be persecuted. She would be uh, the dragon would try to swallow her up, even though she would be hidden. So the true church had to go underground. This is the place of safety that it's talking about. 
So as the true church went into the wilderness, in other words, underground, where the papacy couldn't destroy her, you know, the Catholic Church, folks, over the past centuries, on average, have martyred 40,000 people a year. Martyred. Even, even the Pope has admitted to, I think the current Pope maybe, or maybe the one before, I can't remember, has admitted that, that the, you know, the uh, terrible uh, uh, martyrdom that took place under the, the papacy. He's admitted it. And, in fact, I mean, they don't do it still as far as I know. I don't know. As far as I know, but this has been done over the centuries in the name of heresy. So if you were a heretic or someone who came against the Mother Church, they 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 would uh, cruci or they would behead you, they would crucify, they'd hang you, they'd draw and quarter you, whatever they had to do, burn you, whatever might be the case to get rid of you. But they they stamped out uh, the, the heretics in in so many ways, friends, so many ways that it's it's atrocious what has taken place over the centuries. So 1260 days, 1260 years she would reign from 538 to 1798. And there is when Napoleon would seize her. Napoleon would come in and, and seize her. And actually, let me see if I can find it here. Let's see if I can find it. 1260. On my timestamp. So what's interesting here is is that that Napoleon would come in and take and seize the throne, and and the scripture. Oh, this is so interesting. Hang on, I got a lot of info I'm trying to. So this is this is in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 13. And I saw one of his heads, it's 13, 3. Let me see. And I saw one of his heads, it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And... See, this was the beast that was and is not. Let's see, i got to find that verse because I'm misquoting it. Where is it? i got so much stuff wrote down here. Lord, help me. He was not, he was and is not, and yet is. So this beast would end up, let's see, Revelation 17, 8. Bear with me. Well, okay, here it is. So, so the, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. So this beast represents Rome at the time that, that John wrote the book of Revelation, what she, she is. In other words, she, she was actually, um, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the, the beast, uh, out of the um, bottomless pit, go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall, yeah, okay, we got it. That's the verse I was looking for. So, here's what happened. She was, in other words, Rome was in existence, and up until the, uh, until the uh, 19, or 1798, yeah, 1798. A lot of numbers in my head. Forgive me. So 538, she became the, the, the power. She ruled till 1798, 1260 years. And then Napoleon would come in and take the papal throne back and, and turn it back into an Italian state. And then in 1929, she reemerges as a superpower or as a, a power again, which is very, very interesting that she was and is not, and yet is. So there was there was a time when she didn't exist, the time she didn't exist as a papal power, a power of papacy in Europe, which to me, that, that's another exact fulfillment of this particular verse. So 
let's see here, verse 20, verse 16. So here's the, here's the declaration from 1929. This morning, there was, a, there was another sovereign independent state in the world. Premier Mussolini and Car Cardinal Gasparati signed the sovereign independent state of Vatican City. So in 1929, she reemerges. So she was, for 1260 years, she persecuted the church. Whammo. I mean, she, she killed a lot of the saints. Well, and then at the end of that 1260 years, she's taken down. She loses her teeth. She loses her power. She's reestablished in, in 1929. So she was, she was basically dead for, what, 130 odd years, something like that. She, was, she, she did not have her teeth anymore, and, and, and that give, give a rest for the saints. Now when she came back in 1929, she no longer had that same power to kill and that same power over all the earth because the dynamics of the world had changed, Europe had changed, and, and it become, you know, it's different entities of England and France, and, and now she was kind of on her own, and now she could not kill like she was killing before, now she kind of lost her teeth. So this would be the part of the clay. This would be the part of the feet that was clay, the softness. Whereas before she was mean and iron and powerful and she could kill, but now she couldn't anymore. And, and she's back to being just a soft uh, religious entity. Yes, very influential all over the world, but she does not have that martyrdom power that she once had. So God has given us, uh, has given us rest. So she persecuted for 1260 years and now she's somewhat toothless. So this is, this is an exact fulfillment of this stuff, folks. So, you know, what, what is the, uh, again, we talked about the, uh, the mark, you know, the mark of, of the buying and selling that we read in 18.3, I think it is, 18 chapter 3, or eight, 18 verse 3. Um, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, here we're talking about the commerce of this woman. If this woman is a physical Babylon, then this commerce would just be, you know, the trinkets of this life, the physical things of this life. But I want to show you something. Very interesting here. Maybe you've never seen it. Maybe you have. I know I'm all over the place here, folks. But I think I'm getting my point across. So this is what it says in the 18th chapter, the 11th verse. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Now this is talking about after her eventual fall, after her destruction. Now, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and thinen wood and all manner of vessels of the ivory and manners and vessels of precious wood, brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and, and, and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves. Now, that sounds like uh, a lot of commerce, physical commerce, but this very last mention of what she is buying and selling is, is indicative of what she really is. Now this last thing is the souls of men. Now you notice how he names all these physical things, which are part of the Babylonian system, because remember, she's, she's into trade and she's involved in the world, so she does have physical contacts and physical dainties that she trades back and forth. But you notice the very last mention, which, which is which is what is being sold in her. The souls of men. So she has within her the bondage. of she, she has within her the ability to bring men under bondage and to buy and sell them. Not in a slavery way, because you remember, slaves are mentioned before this, and then the souls of men. Even in slavery, you can sell a slave, but you can't sell the soul. And so these soul, this souls of men that's in this commerce right here is indicative of the fact that this woman has, has men under bondage of her system. 
So her buying and selling, friends, is not just, we're not just talking about physical merchandise here. We're not talking about the, the distribution of money in the church system, although that's part of it. But we're talking about a commerce of spirituality. We're talking about the souls of men being in the mixture of this commerce. So the buying and selling here is not talking about your groceries, not talking about the, the ability to survive physically. It's talking about paying homage to a religious system. And that religious system will keep you alive in it as long as you keep trading in it. You keep trading your goodness. You keep trading your righteousness. You keep trading uh, your, your own nature and your own virtues and your own, your own importance in society and your own importance in your neighborhood and your own importance in your church. As long as that ego is what's driving you and, you, and you're getting something back by paying homage to her and giving her devotion... And the, the people are paying back to you by patting you on the back and making you feel important and, and, and making you feel egotistical and making you feel like you're, you're really doing something good for the world. That's the commerce, folks, of Babylon. That's the mark of the great whore. So, <clears throat> I've been at this two hours. My voice is getting pretty rough. Hang with me. So I want to show you one last thing here. There's a lot more I want to show you, but this is ultra important. But this is something that I saw from a young man online. And, um, you know, I'm not an expert on these things, but I, I did look into it a little bit. And there's a lot of history here, and I'm going to show it to you. So you can screen, you know, you can freeze it when I put it up. And I want to show you that. You know, this number of Revelation chapter 13 that, you know, we hear often the, uh, people talk about the number. I'm going to read it. It's verse 17 and 18. And, and no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, number of his name. Here is the wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is six. Hundred three score and six is where we get the number six 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 right so which everybody on the planet pretty much knows that number but what does the number mean when it says it's a number of a man a lot of people believe this is going to be in the computer chip that goes in your hand or on your forehead they're going to scan you and it's going to be you know six 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 and and let me just tell you something friends I want to make a statement to you you might understand. One of Satan's best tools is to have a counterfeit of a counterfeit. And we'll explain what that means. While the devil's got everybody on in the earth on edge about this number, you know, being physically placed on you and placed in your hand, placed in your forehead, behind the scenes he's working his angle. Imagine it this way. If you're, you know, you're in a robbery and someone has you at gunpoint, and, you know, you're resisting. You're like, man, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to give up my stuff or I don't want to give up whatever. And, and, and they're, you know, they don't really want to, they don't really want to kill you per se, but they, they're threatening you with a gun. They don't really want to have to do it. And then someone sneaks up behind you, you know, someone else they have with them sneaks up behind you and gets you around the neck and takes you down. And then they rob you. They don't have to kill you, but they rob you. So. That's what Satan is doing. While he's holding this gun of fear to humanity about the number, the you know the the, the chip and the vaccine, you know everybody's in fear about you know in consternation about this. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? He is working behind the scenes in this spiritual system. The spiritual system is 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 a number that he's already put on you. See, and he wants you to be fearful of that physical one, so you'll keep the the spiritual one on you. So you won't realize what really it is. So Satan is excellent at counterfeiting a counterfeit. That's how he dupes mankind. So he's counterfeiting the, the church with, with, with uh, organized religion. And then he's counterfeiting organized religion with the false idea that the, that the number is some physical mark you're going to get. So he's got everybody in fear and they're missing the point that somebody's behind him about ready to strangle him. You follow me? 
So this number, very interesting, if you, if you trace this number, now the papacy, now this is controversial because they deny this and they, they, they've scrubbed it pretty much from the records, but you can go in, if you do enough research, you can find that the papacy's original uh, name that they went by was the Vicar of Christ. That's what the Pope is called, the Vicar of Christ. In other words, God's representative on the earth. Right? They get that from Peter. They believe Peter was the first pope, which is nonsense. But regardless, they think that the pope is he who answers for, you know, for God, answers to, to uh, as God to the people. And so that's, that's called vicar of, the, of Christ, which means the vicar of the Son of God. This is Latin for vicar of the Son of God. Now, here's what's interesting. If you take this, this word in Latin... It is, is actually, or, or yeah, Vicar of the Son of God is English, but the, the Latin version is Vicarious Filii Dei. This is three words. That means Vicar of the Son of God. Now, if you take those that number and you, those names, and you add them up in Roman numerals, Roman numerals, letter by name, I want, you to show you, I want to show you something here, friends. This adds up to, 666. Now this, I didn't come up with this. Somebody else put it together. I checked it out. And this, this is actually historical. It's just been covered over. But you can find it if you research. But this, this is actually was worn on the Pope's crown for, for many, many centuries. This name, Vicar of Christ, or Vicar of the Son of God. So this is not something uh, that, it's not true. It's actually part of history. But if you take those Roman numerals and add them up, now, now it doesn't end there. So he's also called the Vicar of the Court. Now this also adds up to 666. It's also called the Dux Clare, Captain of the Clergy, which also adds up to 666. The, the, uh, Rex Latinus Secretus, which is King of the Roman Priests, also adds up to 666. Uh, Sancta Dux uh, Lux Dei, which holy light of God, also adds up to 666. Now, now you can call that a coincidence if you want. And, and you can, you know, you can walk away from this dream and, and you know, shake your head and say there's no way. That's a possibility. But folks, do your own homework. It's right there in black and white. And, you know, it's 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 as it's as obvious as the nose is on your face that this is all fulfillment of prophecy, all fulfillment of of what the Bible uh, tells. But but again, let's let's not let's not just go uh, anti-Catholic here, because that's not what this is about. The 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 the, por the importance here is to distinguish between the two marks. The mark of God is the indwelling. Christ, those who have been born of the Spirit, those who have him indwelling in them, not just anybody that's had an experience or anybody that's believed, no. The mark of God, remember, if he hath not the Spirit of Christ, then he is none of his. So it's all about ownership. It's all about that mark, that seal being on us. And anybody outside of that that doesn't have the seal has the mark of the beast, which they are outside of the economy of God and in danger of judgment and will be so until they are born again, repent of their sins and come into the economy of God, the kingdom of God. So friends, there you have it. That's a pretty good thorough rundown of it. I've got, there's a lot of stuff I left out, a lot of stuff I'd like to talk about, but, but overall, just know this, don't fear things being put in your hand, things put in your arm, uh, listen, friends, fear fear him rather that is able to cast your whole body and soul into hell. Fear God and get right with him and stop walking around in conspiracy theories and worrying about this being the mark and that being the mark. Just get right with God and walk with him in righteousness and not fear or leave. You don't have to worry about those things. Whatever happens, happens. For here is the patience of the saints. And those who have the testimony of God and the faith of 
Jesus Christ. I love you all. I'm glad I've got to uh, share this with you. And I'll see you next time.